Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to viewers around the world. I'm Jeff Colvin, very glad to have you with us for this final session of Open Talk 2021. I should mention at the outset that we're doing this session in English, but if you would like to hear it in Chinese or Japanese, uh, look at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a little button called interpretation. All you have to do is click on that and you can hear translation into Chinese or Japanese. Well, today, 16 years after Zhang Rimin put forward the Rendon Hoyi model, we see that the model is more relevant, more useful, and more influential than it has ever been before. Uh, we've learned how companies around the world, in Europe, North America, South America, Africa, Asia, are finding value in Rendon Hoyi principles, uh, and they're applying them in their businesses. We've learned that these principles seem to be universal because they're not based on any particular culture, but instead are based on fundamental human qualities and on the realities of the Internet of Things era. I've been particularly struck by the central principle of maximizing human value. It's extremely powerful and it resonates with everyone. Now in this final session of Open Talk 2021, we're going to see how Rendon Hoyi principles are being discovered and embraced by businesses of all kinds, and in fact are becoming standards uh, recognized and formalized globally. We're looking forward under the theme, humanizing the future. We start by asking two management visionaries about the trends they're seeing now. Emanuele Quintarelli is someone we've met already during Open Talk. He's an expert in many organizational concepts, including Rendon Hoyi. Norman Wolf is a consultant to many organizations, author of a book called The Living Organization, and a strong believer in the deep human essence of every enterprise. Uh, Emanuele, let me start with you. You have studied all kinds of organizational concepts, uh, holacracy, sociocracy, many others. What got you interested in Rendon Hoyi? Thank you, Jeff. Very happy to be here with you. Um, I think the Rendon Hoyi really stands out for a few reasons. Uh, the first question I always get from clients or from people looking at new organizational models is, have you ever seen this model scale to thousands of people? And usually the answer is, we don't know. And yet, Hire has been doing this for decades on tens of thousands of people on different countries. So the first level of interest that I see in the Renone is the scale. The second point is that uh, we have plenty of examples in the market uh, of what we call unbundling the organization. So fragmenting the organization in many small autonomous or semi-autonomous teams. I'm sure Rachel will talk about Zappos, Jürgen is talking about Posh, and there is Bjurzerg, uh, there is Morningstar, but many of these examples uh, haven't uh, yet figured out how you can recombine the teams without hierarchy. So without basically management at scale. Ayer has done that again. And third, uh, it has done that through technology as well. We talk about blockchain, we talk about smart contracts. So in a sense, uh, we are unlocking human potential. We are maximizing the potential of human beings uh, at scale through technology and around the user scenarios. And that's another characteristics. I'm in love with, you know, organizational design and development topics, uh, but not everybody is. Most managers really look at customer outcomes and organizations uh, are paid uh, uh, by customers. IR has been able to connect uh, the business model world, the innovation world, the, the customer world to a new idea of organizational development uh, that is inspired by complexity. And that's another topic, I think. Uh, it's an example of how thousands and thousands of actors can recombine around the user needs in a fluid, in adaptive, and an emergent way. I've never seen something like that. So to me, that's the interest in the Renan AE, and that's uh, how we are getting inspiration from it uh, in other organizations beyond China and beyond the industry in which higher is. 
when you are uh, working with organizations that are interested in these things, is there any hesitancy in putting so much responsibility in the hands of so many different people? The, the first answer we get when we introduce organizations to Renan is, you are crazy. <laughs> we, we are never going to do that. We are not like Ayer. We don't have a German Jiang Zemin. We are regulated. We are not in China. There, are, There is a long list of, you could say, excuses or anyway, rationals for being cautious. But that's exactly the point. Uh, I don't believe you need to copy the Renan I don't believe you need to be Ayer. I believe each organization, it's unique. The goal is not copying. The goal is defining, is transferring the ownership to the organization to define a unique evolution journey, not transformation. We are not going from A to B. There is no A, there is no B. This is in flux and the body knows the future. It's about taking ownership and defining a personalized uh, journey that is influenced by the people and that is done by the people in, in the organization. When you approach this in this way, you are mitigating the risk, you are maximizing the empowerment of the people, and you are defining uniquely contextual emergent solutions. It becomes much easier, and especially it becomes possible. Uh, so it's, it's possible to, to do it. Most organizations are really scared, but if you look at the people in this room or the people that uh, have presented in this conference, you see the restructuring. There are tens of thousands of organizations that are exploring the random AE and they are trying not to figure out if, they are trying to figure out how to take inspiration from it. Yeah. Uh, Norman, you have a very specific view of how organizations work, uh, what makes them succeed or fail. When you listen to Emanuele talking about these ideas, how does that fit with your view of organizations? Uh, Norman, you're on mute. Uh, yeah, Norman, uh, yeah, you're muted. <laughs> I got to admit, I just love talking to myself. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> thank you for, for having me. The, uh, the, the last statement the manual made the, the question is not whether they want to, it's how do they do it. It's really been a key focus point of my efforts as a, as a leader and as a consultant. And um, the, the challenge that I've seen is we come up with a lot of supporting structures, new models, new, new technology. At the end of the day though, um, it's the people who have to receive or, or take ownership for these new ways of working. The challenge I've seen is that, and Emanuele was right when he said, it's about transferring ownership. Well, you can't, I use the phrase, you cannot delegate into a void. What I mean by that is you can't give responsibility to people who are not prepared for it. And for me, that's really a maturity issue. So it, it, in the past, we look, looked at companies as, um, the way you define the capacity of an organization was by its plant and equipment. In the 21st century, I believe the way you define the capacity of an organization to produce outcomes is based on the capability and maturity of the, of the people in the organization. And so all of these, what I'll call aspirational visions, uh, such as Rendon who requires a certain transformation of the maturity or the development of the maturity of the people. When, when I began to look at those kinds of concepts, I began to realize you can't make a machine mature. So our existing paradigm of an organization as a machine, uh, change its process, redesign it, whatever you do, is not gonna develop maturity. So I began to look at an organization as a living person, a collective of people, takes on a personality, and you can see that throughout any organization. Uh, just look at a sales department versus an accounting department. They have very different personalities as a collective. And so I began to explore how do you, how do we get to where we want to get to? And the challenge is I've got to still produce results while developing 
and maturing the people in my organization. The more mature they are, the more ready they are for these kinds of principles. Now, it's very uh, intriguing that you talk a lot about the maturity of the organization and of people in the organization, because for all the talk that we all do about our organizations, very rarely do I hear the word maturity or the concept of maturity ever talked about. Could you just elaborate a little bit on what you mean by that? Sure. So if you, if you look at the easy way to understand it is to look at raising a child. Now, if I have a very young child, I'm not going to give them responsibilities. Uh, like I won't give the keys to the car to an eight-year-old. Right? Nobody would ever think about doing that. If you, and, and so to, to prepare the child to be able to drive a car, I want to develop a certain level of responsibility, a certain level of ownership of their actions, uh, a certain level of uh, being able to think through uh, the decision-making process. Okay. That's maturing a child. Well, the same thing happens in an organization. Traditionally, we looked at organizations as being having people in it that require what to do. When, when I took over as region admin manager for Hewlett Packard, this was many years ago, I had a very large organization, and everything in the organization required approval from above. I, I define it as don't think, just do. And you know, that limited the capacity of the organization to produce. So at low levels of maturity, you have standard operating procedures. You have uh, people who are told what to do. You have very defined um, measurements at, at the very lowest level. When I work for HP, we manage by objectives. So let's say that's a medium level of maturity where I'm not given standard operating procedures. I'm given objectives to, and then I get to create within those objectives. Rendon who he takes it to the highest level of maturity where everybody's taking ownership for the manifestation or creation of outcomes for the good of customers. So the beauty of Rendon who is that it really is trying to maximize human value and human potential. And it's recognizing that, that at the highest levels, people are acting like mature adults as a collective of people and not depending on people telling them what to do. Yep. But if you try to do that too quickly, then what you have is a, you're trying to get your 30 year old who's always been told what to do and how to do it to now grow up when they're still living with the parents. Right, right. Uh, this really uh, is interesting because it fits with so much else that we've heard about. Uh, Emanuele, uh, you've told us a little bit about the response you get from the managers, from the leaders of a company when they first hear about these principles, which is, you must be crazy. But what about the response from uh, the people throughout the organization when they hear about these uh, concepts? What responses have you seen? Well, let me clarify on the first point. Uh, yes, the first reaction is you must be crazy, but uh, also addressing John Dobbin question, uh, the organization sees the benefits and wants to have this uh, intimacy with customers, uh, wants to motivate employees, want to be nimbler, more adaptive, uh, more prepared for the future. So it looks scary. That's why they say you must be crazy. But actually, this, the benefits that you can bring uh, are important. For employees, actually, it's, uh, it's easier because we have millions of people that just die every Monday morning. And this is the opportunity for them, you know, to unlock themselves, to develop themselves, to look for new positions, uh, to make more money also, to, to act as a, an entrepreneur without necessarily getting all the risks of being, uh, of being one. So there is so much interest both at the senior management positions, but also inside your organization to get this chance of shaping the business, of making a dent in the market, of reconnecting with customers, and at the end, uh, you know, realizing themselves. So being happier, uh, more satisfied about, about the work, and ultimately, it's about purpose. So 
why I'm doing this? Why I'm, am I spending all of my life at work? Most of us don't have this answer. The people that we see in this kind of organizations uh, find meaning, not only, but also into the work. Uh, and this just amplifies results so much. So it's good for the business. It's good for, for people. Of course, there is uh, a lot of uh, unlearning and reinvention that is not so quick and not so, so easy. I think this is the, to me, the topic. So how you can make that happen. Right. Uh, have you had the experience or have you noticed that there may be people in an organization who themselves are not ready or, or at least uncertain about yes. giving up their old role and taking on the new role you described for them? Yeah, you're right, Jeff. Jeff. Basically, it's a, it's a, a two-pronged uh, transformation, if you want. On one side, somebody is stepping back leaving the space, but on the other side, somebody else should move a step forward. So taking the space. And uh, I think, again, it's about the transition strategies. It seems everybody is imagining a transition from zero to one. In my experience, if you are talking about 50,000 people, 100,000 people, uh, big organizations, that's never the case, never the case. It's about uh, defining uh, a journey that uh, resonates with the level of maturity, with the propensity to risk, uh, with the, you know, the demand from, uh, from the market uh, competition, and it could be quicker or slower, uh, but it's always an experimentation and uh, an iteration. So you need to find the people in your organization that are willing to make the step. It's not all of them. And you can define ways to mitigate this fear. I'm sure Rachel will talk about that. Uh, uh, IR is pushing a lot on making everybody a CEO. That's not the only way. Uh, different com companies, different cultures may have different levels of propensity to risk. Yeah. It's not the only way. I've seen uh, uh, Make is an example in which you use uh, a stage gated process of investment of time and money based on the level of validation of the idea. So the more the idea is validated and valuable, the more time you leave people and the more money you give them. So the risk increases with the perceived value of, of the idea. You can have somebody making the owner and somebody making just a team member. So there are different strategies for sure. It's not black or white. And if we look at that, not as a black or white, uh, this is universal, as you said. Uh, Norman, uh, unfortunately, I, we're almost out of time for this topic, but I'm very interested in what you would advise uh, to companies that are considering making a transformation of the type we've been describing in this session so far. Uh, right at the beginning, what do you advise them to do? Well, <clears throat> I think what Emanuele said, this is not a, a, a single step. It's a transition process. And, and quite frankly, I, I work with my clients. I work with, I, I start them off by first start thinking of your organization as a living being. And the reason for that is you begin to think in a different way. You begin to frame the challenges differently. You look at it as you, the questions you begin to ask are centered around, how do I develop this, this collective of people, right? And, and, it, and it opens up a whole, just that reframing is a whole new way of addressing it. And we're actually in the, in the process of developing a uh, organization maturity assessment, because as you pointed out, not very many people think that way. So we're trying to give them a baseline of where are they so they can recognize what is the right next step so that they can develop it because it is a journey. And, and some people are ready, boy, they're just eager, as Emanuele said, to move quickly into the next phase of this development. And others are much more reticent. And as an as a, uh, employer, I've got a whole mix of those people. So how do I know what the right balance is? That's the key thing is to find that. Uh, we've been doing it uh, in, intuitively through our experience of being able to read the collective but we want to make that uh, more visible to others. And that's where we're developing the assessment. Thank you. Uh, this, is, this is really revealing uh, to see the commonalities in, 
in what you've seen and uh, what you've learned. Uh, Norman Emanuele, thank you very much. Uh, now we're gonna hear the stories, the personal stories of two people whose organizations have gone through significant transformations or are going through them now. Uh, very different companies, very different transformations, yet with some common themes. Uh, Rachel Murch is co-founder of the Manic Group, which helps organizations transform themselves. She previously spent 10 years at Zappos, an e-commerce company that some of us know very well, where she helped direct a particularly ambitious transformation. Uh, Jochen Gusser is leading a transformation right now at Robert Bosch Power Tools, part of the Bosch Engineering and Technology Company. Uh, Rachel, uh, we've heard references already to the transformation you worked on at Zappos. Could you tell us briefly what it was and why it was undertaken? Yes, of course. Hello, everyone. Um, happy to be here. Um, the organizational initiative that has been referenced thus far is actually called market-based dynamics. So as you can imagine through those words, it's a more market-based way of organizing and operating a company. Um, I would say in simple form, it is giving each team the opportunity to operate like a small independent business, obviously within the umbrella of the organization Zappos.com, but that being said, um, they were really able to have the autonomy to the degree that they wanted. And in that, um, one of the foundational elements there was actually every team operated its own p &L. So um, in short, that I feel like actually put every team on the same playing field, um, the same baseline and opportunity to be able to do what they felt like they needed. Um, there was really only three constraints for teams, and that is that their business or their team had to kind of fall in line with the culture and core values of the company. So if you know anything about Zappos.com, of course, very strong in their 10 core values and culture. They also had to differentiate themselves based on uh, customer service and customer experience, because that's what Zappos is all about, actually. <laughs> We always like to define ourselves as a customer service company that just happens to sell shoes, clothing, jewelry, bags, all of these things. Um, so how can you apply customer service to any type of business? And um, if we get a chance, happy to share a little bit more about that. And then the third constraint, if you will, is actually you just had to balance your P&L. There's some complicated stuff behind that, um, but those were the kind of the three lines, if you will, or boundaries you had to stay within. And that was it. And just so we know, what was the before picture? How was it organized before this? Um, I'll say not super intentionally. Um, it was more of a traditional hierarchy. That being said, Zappos, even after 20 years of existence, was still had a lot of the startup mentality. Um, so kind of even applying not intentionally, but uh, the Rinde uh principles of having some shared services and things like that is the direction that we move through the market-based dynamics model. Um, and before that, everything was very much centralized. Uh, great, and just one more question before we'll come back to this a little later, but uh, as you said, the, the teams now could go into any business in theory uh, as long as it was as followed the constraints that you outlined. In practice, has anybody gone very far from shoes and apparel and related <laughs> merchandise? Um, yes, and I also realized I didn't answer yet the other part of your question, which was the why, um, yeah. but let me answer this one. And one example is actually a theater business. So Zappos, there was a, a, you know, in the spirit of customer service and customer experience in a traditional theater model, you go, you sit, you have to go stand in line forever to get your merch or go stand in line and leave the show, if you will, to, you know, purchase a drink or food. So um, Zappos actually uh, has a theater downtown that they sponsor, still doing, obviously it was closed for a bit. Um, but it was a Zappos theater and they were kind of revolutionary, uh, revolutionizing 
the theater experience and the show experience. As you can imagine, being based in Las Vegas on the Strip, there were lots of opportunities <laughs> to make improvements there. And quickly about the why, it's really yeah. about you know survivability and um, not just sustainability as an organization, but with you know the evolving world that we live in and the advances in technology. I mean. 25 years ago, nobody thought you could buy shoes online, right? Uh, that obviously changed, um, but what else could we change and also just evolve the organization to be able to you know, flex and adapt, sense and respond to the market? Thank you very much. Uh, Jochen, tell us about the transformation that you are uh, overseeing right now. Uh, again, what's the basic idea? And why are you doing it? Yeah, thanks, Jeff, uh, for having me um, on this panel. Well, um, um, we have a transformation that we call Agile Transformation. We started the journey almost six years ago. Um, and the fundamental question was um, how we can we become more user-centric um, based on Agile values. And the user-centricity is at the core since we started that journey. And um, with user, we really mean the people who use our tools, be it the the, the professional builder on the construction side or the DIY at home, um, because this person, yes, we always develop tools for them, but they were not, we didn't have so much direct contact with that. And I think there were three major trends that we saw in the market or within our organization that really asked, uh, led us to the conclusion, are we really close enough to the user? Are we flexible and fast enough? And are we adaptive enough? And I think these three things really uh, uh, stood up to, to start this journey, this exciting journey six years ago. And so how far along are you now? Um, well, we were very keen in, in, in setting up this project at the beginning to say we, we look at agility from a holistic perspective. I mean, people in the, in the room or in the chat know agility. Uh, it can be everything and nothing for, for many people, right? I think we really tried to look into five bubbles, as we call them, five sections. So how do we need to change the leadership, leadership style in our organization? How do, you, do we need to really uh, foster and, and enable a collaboration culture? I mean, you have now much smaller teams in our organization, but they need to collaborate a lot with each other. Um, we changed the organization upside down, also similar to what Rachel just said in small business uh, teams, as we call them, with end-to-end -end responsibility, but also processes and methods and, and, and strategy. So these five pillars are really keen for us. And the journey started six years ago. Um, I'm usually getting a bit frustrated when people ask me when it's finished because then they didn't understand the whole thing at all because <laughs> like Rendan Hay and other things, it's like a continuous journey, right? Um, so I keep them busy with finding out new things that we can improve. And I think at the moment, um, yeah, we are, we are doing quite good there. So what have you noticed in going through this transition? Uh, were there, uh, for example, uh, reactions by the, the workers across the company uh, towards this whole idea? Did they embrace it? Were they skeptical? Um, other things that you particularly noticed as you implemented the changes? Now, let me tell a little um, story with that, uh, Jeff. I mean, when I started with Bosch, and that was actually five, six years ago, I entered a room full of 20 volunteers of the organization and they have been volunteering, signing up to be part of this, what we call agile transformation. Um, and I entered the room with full enthusiasm and basically people looked at me and said, okay, when do we need to do it? How do we do it? What do we need to do? And what's the milestone? What's the plan? And I basically said, no, there's a blank page. There's a blank page and we need to define it together. I mean, it sounds funny now, but it was really a a very, very uncomfortable situation for a couple of weeks with getting those people moving um, and building up a trust relationship that we don't have a hidden plan. We want to that they really part of it. But I think three, four weeks into the game, the people saw it's like a light switch. You know, they say, well, there is no plan, but they really want our opinion. Let's co-create. And then they, you see these people flourish. You know, you, this is just fantastic. Um, that is a very revealing story. Uh, do you think the, it's important or that, uh, that, I mean, Robert Bosch is a very big, famous, long established, very successful business. I can imagine all of those things being problems when you try to implement something like what you are, are doing. Is that fair? 
Jeff, you have a very nice and diplomatic way of telling us yes, the Germans <laughs> are a big company and we're engineering background and change is not one of the biggest things we are famous for, at least in Germany. And I can say that as I'm a German. Um, I, I, I would say um, you're totally right. Um, I think the beauty there is that if you look back at the Bosch history, and we are also over 100 years old company, the, the basic values of the Robert Bosch actually were very, very keen on focusing on people. And I think um, he would have been probably one of the, the startup founders in, in today's. And when you look at those values, actually, for many people, including like people who are along with the company, they say, now we are going back to our original values. And, and I think that's something which I also emphasize when you have agility or rent and hay or whatever. Um, yes, it's new way of thinking, but at the end, it's based on old values. And it, that's why you can connect a lot to people, no matter what age they are, no matter, no matter what background they are, and no matter what culture they are. So that's really the beauty in it. Yes, we had some tr uh, some some bumps along the road, but that's that's also part of the game. But we see much more um, light in the eyes of our people, and much more eagerness to work together with us and shape the future together. Uh, w one more thing, and we'll come back later. But have you noticed a change in the people who come to the company? Uh, uh, for jobs? With, have you noticed a change in the people who come to work for you? I think at the beginning, I mentioned, Jeff, that we had three market things, uh, and I don't want to elaborate on the two which we call uh, digitalization and, and globalization. But the third layer was really why we started the journey was um, to, to be attractive as Bosch, as Bosch power tools for people that usually have perhaps other companies on, on their wish list to, to have jobs for. So, uh, I mean, the whole Bosch organization is in a big transformation with automotive, with our consumer goods business. But I think that the, the underlying thing is how can we also be very attractive for people that usually apply for people, uh, for other companies, startups or in the, in the Silicon Valley or wherever they are. So I think that was a big, uh, big thing that we wanted to achieve. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rachel, it's interesting to hear the stories of you and Jochen because, of course, Zappos uh, was in many ways kind of the opposite of uh, the Bosch organization. It was not old, it was not gigantic, and it had a very different culture from the beginning. What did you find were the key steps in the process of making the change that you wanted to make? Well, I think, um, as I said before, one of the, the first, you know, really big steps for us that actually seems really complicated, but we started very basic, which is start tracking um, who you're working with inside of the organization. So who are, who are your customers internally? So if I am the you know, the app development team, for example, you know, who am I developing that for? Obviously, there's a connection to external customers, but internally, where are you, you know, having those relationships? And so we actually just started by, by asking everyone to start tracking who are your customers. And then we started to be able to have this visualization of the whole organization as a network, internal network to start with. Um, and you know, understand who the kind of the players are and what the capabilities are within the organization. And then from there, there were actually steps that allowed teams to start to provide their services externally, uh, which is which is kind of interesting. It's, it's similar to like the AWS model for Amazon, solve a problem internally and then offer it externally. Um, also through that opportunity, we were actually, um, giving people the opportunity to form teams of one, which is interesting. So think of it as like a, you know, sole proprietor inside of a company. I can, I'm on a team. I'm not happy. There's some, you know, constraints or whatever it is, team dynamics, who knows? And I want to do what I do best, but I want to do it on my own. Oh, well, there's this opportunity to do so. You have to have a customer at a minimum, obviously internally, but maybe that person wants to sell their services externally as a, again, an independent operator, which is, I think also kind of a, a slight uh, difference from, from a lot of the ways other organizations go about 
I'd say a more networked or ecosystem style model. It certainly is. So just to be clear, it's po- is it possible today for an employee of Zappos also to be selling their services to a non-Zappos customer? Well, I, I mean, mean, if I you guess think it's about it, possible. it's still a, it's still a <laughs> Zappos customer, right? Because right. I'm not, you know, I'm still part of the Zappos umbrella. I'm still representing right. Zappos, right? So, right. and you still right, have to right. be within those those constraints of like culture I, and all of that. So, it's, right. but what it does is you have more you have more Zappos customers. So you have customers right. that maybe don't care about buying shoes or clothing online, right. but they want, um, you know, they want business planning services or they want an app developed as my example before. Yeah, it's really interesting. Right. And that uh, helps evolve the organization, right? As we're talking here is, you know, how do we, how do we continue to stay relevant? And this was mentioned before, put everyone a lot closer to their customer so right. they can s- understand those needs and sense and respond to them. Uh, what, one other point on that. Uh, uh, Zappos had at least a very famous hiring process. Uh, I, I remember mm-hmm. reading a lot about it over the years. Did that change with this change? Um, well, the process itself didn't change um, because that was very successful. That being said, what did change was the opportunity for teams to reinvest in themselves. So think of it as a small business. Right. If I'm above my p you know, I have a positive p and I have the opportunity instead of, um, you know, doing whatever else with the money, buying new computers, I don't know, you could actually hire. You had the opportunity to develop your own, you know, uh, recruiting process, if you will. The process itself is the same, but you can invest in hiring in a different way. Got it. That's great. Uh, uh, Jochen, uh, one closing question for you. After six years of going through the transformation that you are overseeing, how would you advise companies that want to do something like what you are doing? How should they start? I think first you need to build and really feel the temperature in the organization and really encourage people to be bold to move. I mean, um, I think we live in a time where we are very risk averse, especially when you're a big organization. And, but we see also very, big examples where risk aversion really brings total failure at the end. So I think this boldness or to move is something that you need to encourage the leadership team and the associates to take some risks. And then I think based on a couple of principles that you need to define yourself, I think you have a very good starting point to begin this journey. Extremely helpful. Uh, Thank you, Jochen. Thank you, Rachel. I can't help noticing the recurring elements in so many of these stories, and above all, human value maximization. What we've heard in every single uh, story from every speaker so far is that this all comes down to an intense focus on the people in the organization and changing the way they are regarded, changing the way the organization conceives of them and their roles. Uh, everything else follows from that. And we've heard about these other uh, Rendon Hoyi principles too, zero distance to the user, self-organizing business units explicitly, uh, being paid by the user. Um, these recurring elements are the reason it's possible to standardize the Rendon Hoyi model. And we are now seeing that beginning to happen. Uh, in fact, EFMD, a major organization in management development, uh, yesterday, I think, launched its Rendon Hoyi certification. Uh, here to tell us more about that is Martin Mirle, uh, Corporate Service Director of EFMD. Martin, uh, what is this certification and uh, what, what does it represent? Thank you, Jeff, for having me. Um, let me just uh, start with how we... Um, came to the idea to, together with HIRE, collaborate on that project. Um, So we are a 50 year old membership organization with around a thousand members in 90 countries. And our mission is to promote excellence in management, education and management development. And we run a number of 
accreditation and certification schemes already um, for entire business schools, business school programs, for corporate learning functions that try at the very holistic level to um, really assess where an organization stands and where it could go. And um, we got introduced to hire by my predecessor, my role, Richard Straub, who runs the um, Peter Drucker Forum and uh, Haya was strongly involved there and we began the conversation and since a year we worked on the idea, is it possible to develop a certification schemes which helps other organizations to look at themselves and understand better where they stand and where they could go to accelerate their own transformational efforts. And um, here we go now, yesterday at the opening session, as you said, of the Open Talk Conference, we inaugurated a global RDHY certification center, which will be hosted by EFMD and which will be home to a certification scheme for management innovation in the IoT era. And it was funny when I presented yesterday, high level, what that is all about. I saw in the chat a comment by somebody, is that not an oxymoron, a contradiction? Is certification and our standards not old school thinking? for a new world of um, autopoiesis and self-organization. And that's a good point. Um, but I would say it depends. Um, Rendan Hay is not as Scrum or Six Sigma, uh, a collection of methodologies, procedures, policies, but it's principle-based at a relatively high abstract level and allows for many ways to implement and go. And if you stay at this level, as a relatively high level, looking at how organizations transform, there is value in giving language and structure to the conversation about where you are and where you would like to go. Sometimes we had now in that project, really, um, when we got this language translated from Chinese, really struggling in finding the right English words for it, because it's a new vocabulary that, that you begin to um, Develop. I saw just in the previous session, Jeffrey Kuhn mentioning value propagation. I wrote it down. I was struggling with finding the right word. I used value expansion, but I think value propagation is even better. Um, and so I will steal with pride a few words from here and there to describe uh, what it is. So what is that certification scheme? It's like the others. It's built first on, on a model through which we look at the case at hand. And secondly, it's a process that you go through as a candidate organization. And um, uh, the model at hand, normally we have a set of standards and criteria that would describe what we would perceive as, as best case, best practice management. Here we have the luxury of having a Rendan Hayes scorecard being designed by Hire, uh, which really boils the principles down on two axes, on two dimensions. It just got updated to a new scorecard, but there is one axis that looks at your organizational and people practices. We call it the uh, development along this axis of self-organization capabilities. And then there is an other axis that looks at your market and user and customer practices. And that's the value expansion or value propagation capability access. And um, in the process, um, we would, uh, a candidate organization ask to really self-assess themselves on a few pages, only three, four, five pages against these centers. What are our practices against the question on how do you facilitate learning across an ecosystem? How do you instill a growth mindset? How do you inspire and align all players in the ecosystem? These are kind of standards that you would respond to and to describe yourself and you would then go through a set of interviews by a certification experts. We build a pool um, and would hope that the Randan Hay Research Centers would um, be uh, part of that pool. And uh, you get a feedback on where you, where you currently stand and where you could go. And uh, together with Hire, we built there a, a two by two grid, which begins with an explorer stage where you are relatively beginning on both axes to develop your capabilities. And if you develop your self-organizational capabilities, um, then you move up to a challenger position. When you mostly do internal 
decentralization, but your customer not necessarily is impacted by, by this um, transformation, or you transform on your um, value expansion capabilities, there you begin to build an ecosystem, as we heard previously, the case of the Internet of Clothes in, in, in the session earlier today, where many uh, um, players from across different industries would be invited. And clearly for a customer, this is a visibly different value proposition than just being narrowly focused on what you are. And, and if you are advanced on both axes, you would end in a, a, a leader position. Uh, the benefits you get through that certification, I would say, are threefold. First, you get an unbiased outside in view. Um, uh, secondly, if this, and that's what Emanuele and, and, and Norman also said, but rarely is such a transformation driven top down, enterprise wide, everything at the same time. It begins somewhere in one division, in one geography, where experimentation begins. Uh, by some courageous people. And such a certification might help you build credibility for the cause and building a real movement that, that, that builds up. And thirdly, it, it provides you access to a community of like-minded transformers. Uh, and all in all, that should help to accelerate the exercise. So that's where we currently stand. We had yesterday um, uh, and a first organization being awarded the certificate that was Fujitsu Western Europe, again, a case where um, out of 150,000 organization, a, a regional CEO who overlooks um, a couple of countries with three and a half thousand people began to solve a problem that he have got. Um, and uh, in 18 months has already advanced uh, really um, uh, very impressively. Is it already a, a enterprise-like movement? No, it's not yet. And, uh, but that's exactly the charm of, of, of seeing how this is evolving over the years and how much that could help um, drive that course. Uh, how, how did you first become uh, aware of or interested in Rendon Hoi? Well, it began in my corporate times. I was chief learning and talent officer at Deutsche Bank, later at UBS. And our CEO at the time really wanted from me to be in, yeah, uh, for one of our strategic retreats of the top management team to get a presentation on what are new ways of managing talent and people. And I came across a couple of publications by Bill Fisher and others, and I took that case. I just knew it out of uh, the literature uh, as one of the cases. They stared at it and said, uh, as Emmanuel said, this is foolish as a bank, you, you wouldn't do such thing. <laughs> and, um, but that was eight years ago. Huh? And, uh, and this bank is currently uh, far advanced in agile transformations in various aspects. So we saw in, in just these eight years that the world has, has, has advanced significantly yeah. in at least getting the awareness that this is the end of the way how we organized ourselves and that we open the door to a new world and nobody has the answers. We are in experimentation stage and uh, you have a bit of a courage. Uh, you have to have courage to move there. In some industries you are forced to, in others, like in banking, you, you might, to please the regulators, just wait a bit. But um, these are interesting times. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they are. Uh, if an organization wanted to learn more about the certification, what's the first thing they should do? They should go on the efmdglobal.org website and under assessments, they are already where they should be. And uh, we were working with the Business Ecosystems Alliance team to build a link from their website onto our website. And um, so that's how you would get there. I just would hope that we, over the next months and the next year, we find opportunities like this one to just make us a bit aware. Right. Thank you, Martin. Very, very much. Extremely helpful. Uh, in addition to this Rendon Hoyi certification we've just been talking about, there is a separate standard uh, being developed for innovation management. It's called ISO 56000, and Alice de Casanova is the chairperson of the technical committee for the standard. Uh, Alice, this is not explicitly a Rendon Hoyi standard. What is it? 
Well, um, first, thank you for having me today and give also the opportunity to present uh, this uh, new standard on innovation management. So this standard has been um, developed um, for the, let's say, nine, eight, yes, eight um, last years. And, you know, um, what we, we, we are using is the ISO approach, you know, in developing a standard and developing an innovation management system. It means that when we are talking about the system, we are going to cover all the layers of the organizations. Um, it means that covers, you know, the, the leadership, uh, the resources that you need to support your, your, your system, also your, your planning to deploy this, the system, the culture that you have behind. So when we talk about the culture, it will be the organization, the, um, the training, all these, you know, elements of your, of your system that needs to be interconnect, interconnected if you want to uh, deliver innovation. And the ISO 56002, so it's the document describing this innovation management system, is reusing the table of content of the ISO 9001, which is, you say, the most famous ISO standard on quality management system. And as we are reusing the same table of content, it's very, you know, simple for an organization to just plug on their existing management system, this dimension of the innovation. And for this, they can use the, the ISO 56002, which is the innovation management system. And in our ISO 56000 series, we have also the documents, some, you know, giving the definition of the innovation, you know, the vocabulary. So that's the easy ISO 56000 um, document. And after we have a set of tools and methods, such as intellectual property management, idea management, partnership management, uh, strategic intelligence management. So we have all these uh, these documents also in our series. This is intriguing because, uh, as you say, uh, ISO is most famous for the quality uh, standards that it uh, developed many years ago, starting many years ago. Uh, but you could imagine that innovation management would seem to be completely different because quality standards, this is a discipline that is based on statistics. Uh, it can be uh, worked out mathematically in some ways. Uh, and innovation management seems much more qualitative than quantitative. Are you finding that nonetheless, you can define a standard for it that's just as uh, clear and rigorous as the standard for quality? Yeah, you know, it was not so easy, especially as a true person to have the community of the quality management system people and also the community of the innovation management people. And, you know, my mission was to make sure that they were able to talk the same language and able to interact. Because that's true that the ISO 9001, at least the table of content, is, can be seen as a, you know, a kind of limitation to the, to the, to the innovation. But we made this effort to ensure that we were talking the same language as the company, as your quality manager, you know, asking the innovation manager to develop processes and to make visible his, uh, the, the, the ways of, of, of working. Same, you know, for the finance people and the organization, they expect to have KPIs to understand which is the return of investment of the innovation. Well, through the standard, we propose approach, we propose tools to put in place, you know, these elements, which are very, you know, which are required by the by the company to understand um, what's your what's your return of investment if you're working on on innovation. Of course, that and that's that was very hard, you know, for the innovation community, um, which has to you know manage uncertainties because when we are talking about managing innovation, we are talking about managing uncertainties. And then how can you put, you know, a framework around this uncertainties management 
just to be visible in the organization and make sure that your work is recognized in the organization. So that's all you know, this, uh, this text that we have um, um, taken into consideration, the, the standard, and uh, that's, you know, that's a guidance standard. So we make only recommendations. They are not requirements in the eyes of 56002. We, we just say, okay, we are a bunch of innovation practitioners. Um, based on our experience, we are sharing, let's say, for us, what's working, what was, what's working well in terms of innovation management. Right. So uh, is this standard a continuing project? In other words, uh, will it continue to be uh, developed? Yes. Um, because of the ISO structure, you know, uh, we have to review the standards um, every two to three years. So there's this revision. But the, um, the technical committee that I share, which is in charge of this uh, of this standard, is developing also new new tools and methods. And we are working also on um, requirement standards. So, okay, we have published recommendations. Um, in 2019 now based on the experience of the implementation of this standard let's see if some of the recommendations can be transformed into requirements to have a kind of baseline on how can you you know put in place an innovation system in your organization yep uh, uh one theme we've heard through this entire session is the central role of the human element, uh, maximizing human value. And some people might think, well, that how does that fit into an ISO standard? In your case, does it fit in? Um, sure. Um, there's uh, a chapter in the ISO 56002, uh, which is dedicated to the culture. And this is um, a, a chapter where you will find all the elements to put in place an innovation culture in your organization. And that's where, you know, we have this human centric vision for, for the innovation, because that's, you know, um, the employees of the, of the company who are in charge of the innovation. That's not only, you know, the innovation manager, officer, or whatsoever, you know, innovation team. That's really all the layers of the organization, all the employees. And, well, we share some recommendation on how to create this engagement for, for innovation and make sure that all employees are contributing to the, um, to the success and the sustainability of the organization. Yeah. Uh, that's so important, and uh, it's intriguing also to hear you talk about it, because I suspect many people might even be surprised that an ISO standard would include a chapter on uh, the culture, and yet, as you say, none of this will work properly unless that is addressed. Uh, final question. Uh, if someone wants to pursue the standard or learn more, what should they do first? Well, they can go on ISO.org and um, look for, you know, the ISO 56000 uh, series. Um, they can join us also in developing the standards. So we are the ISO Technical Committee 279 on Innovation Management. And don't hesitate to reach out to me also if you want to have details on the work plan and to be onboarded into our technical committee. We are very friendly people and we have very interesting discussion regarding innovation management. <laughs> it's good to hear. And thank you, Alice. Thank you very, very much. Uh, it has just been fascinating through this entire session to hear certain themes coming up over and over again. And of course, the primary one is maximizing human value. Every single uh, panelist in this session, each from his or her own perspective has come back to that same central value. And it strikes me as maybe the most important insight in Rendon Hoyi that in the internet of things, a technological advance above all, it frees, it liberates the ability of humans to contribute their whole selves 
it really does enable the maximizing of human value. That's what's come through to me through this all of, through all of this. And it does strike me as the right note on which to close. Thanks for uh, watching this. Hope it's been useful. Stuart, over to you. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you to Emanuele, Norman, Martin, Alice, Rachel, and Joachim for making this final session such a great one. I think we are really getting to the heart of important issues, uh, such as why organizations exist, how can they excite and engage employees, and how they can truly connect customers. I'm not sure that uh, Renden Hai has all the answers, but it certainly has some of them, and, and perhaps more importantly, it encourages people to ask new and demanding questions of themselves and their organizations. So thank you to everyone who's taken part in this event over the last two days. It's been a pleasure and a privilege to hear from so many inspired thinkers and practitioners. I've always believed that there is nothing so practical as a great idea, and our sessions have proved that. Our speakers from Fujitsu, Make in Thailand, GE Appliances, Bosch and Jaipur Rugs provided rich and inspiring stories of the many different aspects of Renden Hai being applied thoughtfully and imaginatively. The winners of the Zero Distance Awards also provided practical inspiration of ideas being put to work in a variety of businesses, industries, and contexts. And we've been fortunate to hear from some great thinkers like the legendary Ed Shine, Mark Grieven, Marshall Meyer, Jeff Kuhn, Wesley Koo, Mike Lee, and Jim Moore, and others. The end result is a huge amount of food for thought, the legacy of truly constructive conversations. So thank you to our friends and colleagues, Annika, Simone, Emanuele, William and Joost. Thanks also to Martin and Eric from the EFMD for their input on the groundbreaking Renden High certification. Also thank you to our friends at the Higher Model Research Institute in Qingdao. And the final and most important thank you from myself and all involved is to Monica Cosman for her tireless work in making these sessions practical reality. And thank you for joining us. You'll be sent a copy of the new ebook, The Power of Ecosystems, and the recordings of the sessions will all be made available at the Business Ecosystem Alliance website. So please share with us any of your thoughts, ideas, and feedback by visiting the Business Ecosystem Alliance website. Thank you very much to all. Goodbye.